What's up, everybody? This is Dr. Nick with Leverage Media, and welcome to another episode of Path to a Million Podcast. Uh, I am here with a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Eric DiMartino. How's it going, brother? Good to see you, Nick. How you doing, Good man? to see you. Um, so for, for people that don't know who you are, give them a little bit of background on um, you know, where you went to school, where you practice, what you do, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I was born and raised in uh, central Pennsylvania, in a small little town uh, near Penn State University. Mm -hmm. I went to uh, undergrad at, from University of Pittsburgh. I love the big city type of thing. Yep. Um, and then I decided I want to be a chiropractor. And uh, at the time, um, I had not been to a chiropractor, believe it or not, but mm -hmm. my uh, mom was going to I one. Was the same one. Yeah, my mom was going to one, and uh, he said, go to Palmer. That's the place to go. So I ended up, uh, I didn't even visit any other schools, <laughs> nothing. I just ended up going to uh, Davenport, Iowa, and, yeah. and that was 1998, and then went to school. and. Uh, yeah, history ever since. Yeah. <laughs> so where do you practice at now? I uh, live right outside of the, um, Detroit, suburbs of Detroit, just nice. north of Detroit. Yeah, I've been there, been there uh, 18 years now, been in practice awesome. for 16 and a half. That's great. Room. Yeah, that's great. And uh, your wife's a chiropractor, you yes. practice with her? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. She's been taking some time to be a mom for yeah. the past you know, decade or so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I actually met her um, in school mm -hmm. and she graduated about six months behind me. Yeah. And she's from Michigan, so she's the reason I ended up going back to uh, to Detroit. Nice. And so, yeah, but the nice thing is now is my youngest is, uh, is five and she's going to be going to full-time school next year. So I think my wife's going to be able to come back and practice more. And you guys are thinking about a second practice, correct? Yeah, that's what I were thinking about doing to kind of, you know, scale a little bit. And yeah. so we can be in different offices and get more associates, make it easier. Yeah, so I'm excited to talk to you about that because we're in the uh, Remarkable CEO program together. Yep. And so just like running the, the practice like a business a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're in the, we're in like the same like small group together. Mm -hmm. And I would say that like out of everybody in our group, I like just kind of just like watching, I'm, I feel like you have really like, taken off and like mm -hmm. implemented more of it. And it's really like changed yeah. the way that you've been thinking. I mean, I think you've been on that path for a little bit now, mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yep. Also president of the uh, Michigan Association of Chiropractic, correct? Yeah, yeah, I've been a president for a little over a year. Nice. Um, Great association. Uh, I love to be politically active as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I gotta do what we gotta do for to keep chiropractic. Absolutely. Yeah. And you guys, house. you guys are active. Oh yeah, we have a big association and we're, yeah. we're, we're out there. So yeah. it's a, it's a lot of fun. Cool. So we'll talk a little bit more about that too. Definitely. So, uh, so you have a, you have a big practice. Um, how many associates do you have? Two right now. Two associates. And about how many people a week do you guys see? Uh, we're in the mid four hundreds. Okay. Sometimes we approach five. Nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, like collection wise, where are you where are you at on the um, yearly? Uh, monthly, we're right about ninety to a hundred, depending on the month. Okay, a thousand a month. Yeah. And when did you crack a million for the first last time? year? Last year was yeah. the first one. That's nice. Um, so we talked a little bit about the structure of the zero to two fifty, two fifty to five hundred, and so yeah. on. Um, so when you started out, did you buy your practice or did you start from uh, scratch? We started from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. I worked for a, uh, a chiropractor for about a year and a half, um, right out of school and, uh, you know, probably the best thing I ever did because yeah. I learned all the things I wanted to do and learned the things I didn't want to do. Right. Yeah, right. Um, and then, uh, you know, hit the ground running and we opened up the office and we got, we got busy pretty quickly. I think that's such an important thing, uh, for, for young chiropractors that, that know they want to start their own practice. Cause I think some like kind of just like are forced into starting their own practice because maybe like the associateships that they find don't work out or they want to live in a certain mm -hmm. place and they just don't have any jobs. So they just kind of like start a business to start a business. Sure. Not really because they have any like real passion for it, but you're pretty entrepreneurial and you like, you probably knew you were going to eventually own your own practice. Why was that year and a half so important to you knowing that you were going to eventually go out on your own? Well, like you said, or like I just said, I learned what I loved about the, the, cause the guy I worked for had a very successful office, mm -hmm. um, you know, so a lot of people made a lot of money, yeah. but there's a lot of things I did not like the, yeah. the way he did it. And yeah. so I got to see that and, and see, you know, okay, that's something I'm not going to do when I have my own practice. And then some things he did phenomenally. I said, look, I'm definitely going to do that. Yeah. Uh, plus getting hands on people, man. I was by right. after a year and a half, I was such a good adjuster yeah. for, you know, you know how it is. The first few months out of school, man, I, yeah, not so good. Right. right. <laughs> so you kind of get to learn on his, you know, his people. And, and yeah, you know, by, by the time I got into practice, I was good at that point. That's good because you, if you start right out of school, first of all, you don't know anything yeah. like how to run a business sure. and you're just not seeing because it takes a while to like start to get some momentum. You'll yeah, see 10, 20, 30 people a week for a while, you yeah. know? And, uh, and so I think that's a, that's a great, uh, great reason to, to be associated. Um, all right. So that zero to two fifty, you guys start from scratch. 
what did you guys do to like prepare yourself? Cause you knew you were going to do it. How much like runway did you have going into it? Yeah. Well, it's funny cause I was actually wanting to work for a couple more years cause I was scared about, you know, get loans and all that stuff to mm -hmm. do it. My wife was like, no, let's do it. And she was the one who was like, let's, let's just do this. And so we just did it. Um, about six months ahead of time, we kind of knew what we were going to do. So we started planning, yep. you know, we started uh, doing a ton of research, you know, talking to different coaches, um, we had already found a location and so we had everything pretty much ready to go so that, you know, once we were going to leave, you know, we were, we were, we hit the ground running. Yeah. So we had already had, um, you know, you know, well, this is showing my age. We had uh, yellow page ads, mm -hmm. you know, the full page ad that yeah. was like, you know, 1500 bucks a month that, yeah. you know, nobody has anymore. But, um, no, we did that. We, you know, we had set up already like dinner talk, like we, we had it, we had it ready to go. So our first month of practice, we had like 50 new patients. Nice. Um, and so we were able to kind of jump very quickly to a, uh, uh, to a decent level. That's right. And that was huge because, yeah. you know, that way we stole a paycheck in the other place, you know, while we're getting ready. And then, so by the time we leave, it's like, we only already have a, you know, jumpstart practice. That's great. I mean, especially to be doing that much marketing, uh, because yeah. back then it's like, there wasn't the opportunities that, that we have now. Sure. Um, the, um, uh, shoot, what was I going to say? The, um, Oh man, I just lost what I was going to say. But anyway, so when you, when you started, uh, you started out fast, how quickly, oh, I know, I know I was going to ask, did you get coaching like right away? Were you like in a program yeah. when you started? Yeah. So we did one, uh, that's right about six months before we opened our office. We used, yeah. uh, in the name or no, sure. uh, David Singer. Yeah. Um, he had some great marketing stuff, great content. We didn't use a lot of his systems in the office, but his marketing mm -hmm. was phenomenal. Yeah. That's, that's great. That was all the new ones. But I, I also think that that's important for whether you're a student or you're an associate to like, if you, if you know, you're going to start your own, like mm -hmm. start getting coached on, on how to do that before it's like happening. Cause if you can like be planning and thinking in those six months leading up to it, man, you can really like hit it hard when you, when you open the doors, Absolutely. cause those bills don't wait just no, because man. you got to like ramp up, you know? No, it was scary. Cause you know, we got a, this was back in the, you know, before the whole financial crisis where we so just waved our diploma and they gave us a hundred thousand dollar line of credit, you right. know, with, I had nothing, you know, nothing in my name. Yeah. And so, you know, by the time we got open, we'd already used like 60, 70 grand of it. So I was like, man, I only got like 30, 40 grand to live off of. Yeah. So it was nice to be able to have all that influx of new patients and instant money. I, um, I, I was the same way. Like I had started, I bought my first practice in 06 and mm -hmm. started my second one in 07. And my dad is in, is in banking in Springfield. And so he was like friends with the the president that I that I went to. Mm -hmm. They literally just like zero money down. They just like gave me the money. I was just like, this is pretty good, you know. <laughs> and then I just I like thoroughly wasted. The, I, I got a hundred thousand dollar loan for the one that I opened from scratch, and I think I just bought everything in Gordon's and like things that just had nothing to do with like actually being able to successfully run right. a practice. If I saw some piece of equipment, well, yeah, we definitely need that, yeah. and then like literally never used it. So yeah, lines of credit are. are a tricky thing. Um, so when you, uh, how quickly did you get to that? Like 20,000 a month? Uh, oh, within start? three, four months. Okay. Um, we were, we were already over a hundred a week within probably two, two to three months. Nice. Um, like I said, it jumped, it went fast. And it mainly was just like marketing, like just bringing people in yeah. right away. And yeah, um, we did a lot of yellow page stuff. Uh, we like, we did dinner talks our second month in practice. Yeah. Um, it was like some, I can't remember what the topic was, but, uh, it was like a female hormonal talk or something. And mm -hmm. we got a bunch of people from that. It just kind of flowed from there. Nice. How did you market it back then? Uh, we did it through the newspaper. Okay. We did That's like full page out in the newspaper, yeah. you know, and it's, uh, you know, free dinner and people would, people would come. It's weird how that works. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Free food. <laughs> uh, <so laughs> still works. It still works, <laughs> right. Uh, so the, the 250 to 500 range, mm -hmm. Uh, did that, did that happen as quickly? Like, did you really like blow through that one as well? Or did that, was that where it started to get a little bit uh, tougher? No, I think we, I'm trying to remember exactly. I know within a year and a half, we'd hit the, the 500, um, you know, a thousand dollar a year, yep. you know, if you did, you know, running total, um, yep. yeah, we were to that point within about a year and a half. And at that point is when we started to stall a little bit. Gotcha. And what was the, uh, I assume it was kind of the same stuff, uh, from the 20 to the $40,000 because both of you were in practice. Then? For the first two years, yeah, we were both in practice. And okay. at the time, we only had one employee. That's a nice thing about, you know, the zero to 250 is that, you know, you can run pretty lean and mean Real and lean. low overhead. Yeah. yeah. As just me and my wife and one, you know, front desk person. And we were able to, you know, see close to 200 a week with, with just that. And then... Uh, and you guys are... You, back then, were you mainly just chiropractic? Because in Michigan... 
like especially back then, I think it was pretty much just like spine only. Oh yeah, the, the, yeah. We had the we had the narrowest scope of practice in, mm -hmm. in the in the nation, which some chiropractors actually liked. But um, so yeah, it was just adjustment only. You couldn't even adjust extremities. Wow. That's how it was back then, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. But now it's you know it's changed. Like in the back alleys, you could. But yeah, yeah. We I'm still did it. But, you know, <laughs> right. we weren't supposed to. Right. Uh, so that that uh, twenty to forty thousand a month. Uh, to talk to me a little bit about that and just kind of any struggles yeah, that you so, saw there. No, so we were able to get there pretty quickly. Like I said, uh, within a year, year and a half. Yeah. Um, I think at that point we had two employees. And then um, at that point, then my wife started having kids and she, she started staying home more. Mm -hmm. And so I was still seeing, you know, all the patients. And we were still seeing probably like 250 to 300 a week. And I was able to, cons and that's where I stayed for probably six or seven years. Yeah. So that was the level where I was probably, you know, bringing in 600 grand, something like that a year. Yeah. And I, I kind of stayed there for a while. And I, I realize why now, because it, it you know it was, it was all about me, <laughs> right? And it, that's I mean it's pretty easy living though. It is, you know, like you're bringing in six hundred, you're probably keeping you know fifty to sixty percent yeah, of it. Absolutely, it's not. I mean, it's not a bad life, you know. Especially so, with all my friends, you know, even my chiropractic friends, a lot of them, you know, they're bringing home a hundred grand at, yeah. at the most. So it's yeah. like the guys I'm hanging out with, I'm making way more than them, and right. this is comfortable, and you know yeah. what, I got the energy, and yeah. But then I realized I didn't want to be tied to my business. I, yeah, you know, wasn't taking vacations, and yeah. It's well, you just, I think you just said like this last year was the, the first year that you uh, actually took like a real vacation. You yeah. Like a whole week off of work. Right. Like a whole, usually you take the chiropractic vacation, you know, Thursday to Tuesday, yeah, right. you know, yeah. but actually it closed an entire week. Actually, did it twice last year. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, but you weren't closed though, right? Like well, you had, I should say, yeah, yeah. Went it, closed. yeah I wasn't in the office. Yeah. You were yeah, closed. Yeah. Not the office. Yeah. The yeah. office was open. I, I was like, that was the nice part about it. Yeah. Um, so you, so from, uh, so that was. Year and a half. You when did you start? When did you start your prep? Yeah. Okay, so like 05, 04, 05 is when you were you hit that five hundred thousand, right. and then twenty nineteen is when you hit the million. Right. So what do you think were the were the biggest stumbling blocks? Because um, I feel like that's the spot that a lot of people get caught in is that five hundred to a million. Mm -hmm. Even like the some of the most successful like doctors that they just mm -hmm. they they end up falling into some place around there. Yeah, well, I think it's it's the desire. Do you do you want to scale? Um, do you want to be a CEO, or do you just want to be you know, a doctor who just loves to adjust patients? That's yeah. what I think. A lot of people that don't want to have a big business, they don't. You know, I have eight employees. A lot of people don't want to deal with that. They just yeah. want to have maybe one or two CAs and just adjust people, yeah. and they make decent money, like you know, low overhead, and mm -hmm. they don't have to deal with employees. They don't have to deal with other doctors. They can just mm -hmm. do their thing. And I think if some people are happy with that, then that's a great place to be. But they're not going to you know, break a million very easily. Yeah. Right. Um, whereas me, I want to do scale. Yeah. yeah. What was the turning point from where you went from? I'm going to do all of the adjusting to I need to bring in an associate. Well, it was actually it worked out great because my sister in law, um, she uh, you know got inspired to be a chiropractor with us. And she came into the practice in 2011, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, and she started working with us. And so that took a little bit of pressure off of me. And then, so we had you know, two doctors, we were able to kind of slowly build, but we still didn't, didn't have great systems. It was still yeah. kind of about the doctors. Yeah. You know, we just kind of, you know, we'd show up and just kind of wing it. Mm -hmm. just, you know, use our personality to, 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 yeah. to drive it, but that can only take you so far. Right. Were you still doing coaching then? Uh, no. No. So you at that point you were just kind of like, I'm good with where I'm at. Yep. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of coast along. Yep. When did you start working with uh, Francis? Uh, two years, two and a half years ago. Okay. End of 2017. And is that when you really started to implement systems yeah. or was it before and that? That was the difference. Yeah, yeah. It was the systems. I, uh, I kind of just would wing it and, and I could do that. And I realized very quickly that if I wanted to scale, that just wasn't going to work. Especially right. if I, if I didn't want the business to be so dependent on me, Yeah. you know, like I'd actually take a vacation and, you know, not see our numbers drop. Um, that that was a big thing I needed. That's what he certainly certainly provided me. Because like I think you know guys like you and I that like, we can do it. Mm -hmm. Like we can figure it out. Yeah. But it's you you can't replicate yourself. Yeah. You know, and especially if you have long term associates, you know they need to have a, a way that they mm -hmm. know that it should be done. Right. And um, what what was it that um, what were the systems that you really put in place that that made the biggest difference in terms of change? What really helped is that uh, we'd already done, I think the doctors already did, did pretty well, but really having an established front desk staff and each person having their own specific job mm -hmm. um, was really key. Like having a check-in CA, having a check-out CA, having yeah. a new patient concierge, having a tech CA who does you know, x-rays and other exams. Mm -hmm. So every, everybody knowing their specific role and how it all fit together was yeah. huge. And they're really training on, on different scripts, on exactly how to do things, on processes, really holding patients accountable. Yeah. Um, that was that, That's what really put us, put us over the top. When you say holding patients accountable, talk a little bit about that. Like, What is it that they do that 
helps hold people. Well, we, we set up expectations and agreements up in, in advance because yeah. they're telling us that, you know, they're, they're coming to us because they want us to you know, accomplish this goal. And we're saying, okay, we're going to help you accomplish that goal. But in order to do that, these are what things you have to do. Yeah. These are the expectations and agreements that we have for you. Yeah. And as you know, some patients don't always like to follow those. Yeah, but we let them know in advance that if, if you don't follow it, we will release you as a patient because mm -hmm. we're here to help you. And if you don't want to be helped, then you're, this probably isn't the place for you. And I think, you know, like people are looking for leadership. Like yeah, they absolutely. want to, especially in their health, yes. you know, they just want to know that somebody has a plan. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they feel like, uh, they, they, like if they like lose the trust in you, that you have the, the plan in place mm -hmm. that then they start making up the rules and they don't know absolutely. anything. So like they should not be the ones deciding what's going to happen and yeah. what's not. They yeah. need accountability. Exactly. Absolutely. And if they see that you tell them, Hey, I need to see you three times a week, but then they only come once or twice and you don't call them out on it. They're right. like, well, the doctor, it must not be that big of a deal because exactly. he didn't call me out. So you it's have just, to do it. it. It's whether it's kids or animals or patients mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, friends, it's like people are always testing boundaries. Yeah, absolutely. And as soon as they realize where the boundary is, uh, they, they tend to, they either fall in line and they become good patients or they yeah. like go somewhere else where they can do what they want to do. Absolutely. Cause there's plenty of offices I think out there that'll just let them run roughshod. So, oh, absolutely. um, did you guys always do care plans or did you just start doing that recently or uh, no we, we've always done care plans we didn't mandate them like we do now yeah. uh, in the past we would kind of make it optional you know there'd be a discount if they chose that but if not they could pay per visit but we've taken that off completely gotcha. that's, that's been a game changer too yeah <laughs> why why so well first of all it keeps them accountable yeah. um they're much more likely to stick with it when they know they've you know paid in advance or, or paying monthly mm -hmm. um it also makes it so much easier on my front desk staff they're not collecting payments every time somebody leaves and you know, they just they get adjusted. They're out the door. They don't need to schedule because we've already done a block schedule. They yeah. don't need to pay because they're on care plans. Yeah, and it just makes it a lot easier. How far in advance do you schedule people out on the block schedule? In three months. Three months. Yeah. So they've got their time set, and then they just mm -hmm. like if something comes up, mm -hmm. they can move it, but they need to move it within that week. Yeah, yeah. We want them to make it up as soon as possible if they yeah. do to miss it. We use a texting system that you mm -hmm. know they get text reminders. You know, the day before and a couple hours before. So they'll usually, if they need to change it, they'll just respond, text back to us. Yeah. And then we'll make sure that we get them in the ASAP. Um, so you've got, you said uh, check in, check out, mm -hmm. new patient concierge, text CA, right? Mm -hmm. um, explain the difference between the check in and, and check out CA and like why you need two people doing those and really like two different types of people. Oh, yeah, totally different personalities, yeah, too, completely. Yeah, yeah so your check-in is your bubbly, super friendly, smiling, just outgoing mm -hmm. person, because they're the first face that people see when they come in. So they're going to be the ones say, hey, Nick, it's great to see you. How are you doing today? You know, and she lets them check in. Yep. If there's anything that needs to be done that day, like if they have, you know, an exam or if they have something going on besides just an adjustment, yep. they'll let them know. They'll, they'll handle all the paperwork. When a new patient comes in, they're the ones who greet them, mm -hmm. give them all the paperwork, you know, collect their driver's license, all that kind of stuff. Yep. So they're they're kind of... You know, when people come in, they're, they're dealing with, with today. Yeah. Whereas your checkout CA is the one that's talking to people when they leave. Mm -hmm. And they're the one who are maybe taking payments. They're the ones who are, um, you know, going over those expectation agreements, setting guidelines. Yeah. They're, so they're more of a little bit of more of a, uh, a hard nosed kind of uh, more rigid enforcer. Yes, <laughs> an enforcer personality. Yeah. And so they're the ones who are, you know, the, the, the keeper of those rules. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they also and they like, can't be afraid to, to ask for money. Some people are not good at asking for money. Yes. The checkout CA has to have zero fear around asking for money. And I think that that is something that, that a lot of doctors don't take into account oh, yeah. when they're hiring front desk people mm -hmm. is, you know, whether it's, whether it's staff or whether it's um, associates, like if associates have weird stuff with money, mm -hmm. uh, one of my associates, like just, he just didn't think it was worth selling like the programs that we, that we, you know, talk to people about in the practice. And I mean, that's a real problem. Huge. If, if like the person who's recommending is like, like I wouldn't pay for that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an issue. Right. And then when somebody's, that's how you end up with, you know, $400 bills mm -hmm. and then somebody disappears on you. Now you're having to like chase them down. You either have to write it off or you have to send them to collections, which nobody wants to do in like a local brick and mortar. And all you had to do is have somebody who's fine with asking for mm -hmm. a $30 copay or $50, yeah. you know, cash or whatever to, to just like it, get into it. But if they have an aversion to it, they will find ways to not, uh, not ask for that money. Yeah. And if it's a doctor that has a problem, that's really, I mean, that's, they're, that's, they're that's, the ones providing <laughs> care. So they don't even value problem. their care. That's, that's all. Yeah. I mean, I remember being like that when I got out of school, we used to, you know, we were kind of in the DE days of, you know, love, give and serve without expecting anything in you know, return. And so we used to give huge discounts for kids and mm -hmm. we used to, I mean, you know, we were seeing, we were only averaging like 
thirty dollars a visit, and yeah. now we're you know we're almost double that because now we don't. I charge kids, same as adults. <laughs> we yeah. don't give discounts for anything because it's the, it's the same responsibility, it's, it's really. the same risk, it's the same time, yeah. sometimes more. Uh, I've never understood that why why kids. We don't have a lot of kids in our practice, but I never understood that why kids were like half price or free if the parent got adjusted. And I'm just like, they should yeah. be treated the same way as anybody else. I think chiropractors have big hearts, and we just we don't want to see those kids not get adjusted because of money, because we know how important it is to yeah. you know be subluxation free. And I think it's just our hearts kind of get the best of us, and we're like, well, just adjustment free. It only takes me thirty seconds. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But then it, you hurt yourself in the long run. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, I, I don't think that they valued as oh, as much if they're not. It's just like you know, throw them on the table and. Yep. get them adjusted so um so when when you uh so the front desk oh i know what i was gonna ask you on the new patient concierge mm -hmm. kind of explain because i'm i'm fascinated with that i would love to implement that in my practice um what it, how do you do it in your practice best thing i've ever done it yeah. frees up so much time we used to have specific times where we could take new patients because the doctor used to do them and we'd spend 20 30 minutes with them and so you'd have to like book off these times and it was just it was kind of in between adjustments and it was just a pain so now we can just do them all the time because the new patient concierge does 90% of the work. So nice. basically the patient comes in, the new patient concierge will take some right in and just does the whole consultation. Nice. And, we, and we have it trained heavily with yeah. these. So they know exactly, these are your people that are really empathetic connectors. Mm -hmm. you, know, you need your new patient concierge to really be able to connect with people, be present with them. You know, it's something I'm not good at, so it's perfect that I'm not doing that <laughs> yeah. anymore. Um, and so really be present and just you know, be great at getting information out, make them feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and so they spend probably 15, 20 minutes with them, just getting a complete health history. And, they, and part of the scripting is they're, they're teaching them about chiropractic as they're asking questions. Nice. So they're teaching them about subluxation and you know, they're, they're talking about their traumas and how that affects you know, subluxation mm -hmm. and you know just all the different things they've done throughout their life and how it has impacted their health up to the day. So they're kind of educating them as they're doing the consultation. And then uh, after they go through all that stuff, then they bring the doctor in and I, my, myself or the associates will just sit there and they basically give us a, the, the new patient concierge yeah. gives us a 90 second overview. Nice. And so it's kind of like, so we're, we're hearing everything. Right. Um, that, so the patient feels like we get what they're talking about, but I didn't have to spend 20 minutes with them to do that. Yeah. And so after, you know, 90 seconds or so, then, you know, we just do our, you know, three, five minute chiropractic evaluation. At that point we tell them, okay, one x-rays, whatever it is, and then we're out. But, so the doctor's only in there six, seven minutes with the new patient, nice. the new patient concierge in, finishes up the exam, does x-rays, all that kind of stuff. Nice. So the uh, when did you implement the new patient concierge? Uh, about, two, about two and a half years ago. Two years so ago. before that, you were, the doctors were doing yep. all of the day one. Yep. I had a Texier that would do the exam and x-rays, but we were doing the whole consultation. Okay. So when you say exam, like what parts were they doing on the, or what parts does the new patient concierge now do on the exam? Uh, well, they'll do like the basic stuff like range of motion tests, those yeah. types of things. Yeah, yeah. they do, do do everything. I mean, the only thing the chiropractor does is we'll palpate. Yeah. You know, we'll check obviously for areas and yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Do you, uh, do you see, was there, was there any drop, like when you made the switch to the new patient concierge, mm -hmm. did you feel like there was any kind of drop off in terms of like the way the patient felt about it when you did, when they did the, um, uh, the consultation or if they did the exam uh, portion? Um, no, I mean, well, they don't know any different. They're in the right. patient, right? So they don't know how we did it before. Yeah. Uh, but no, they, they probably like it better because you know, my new patient concierge, I have two that kind of take turns. Yeah. Um, they're way better at doing that than I am. Yeah. <laughs> they can and, they, and it's somebody that is like with them through the day one and day two process, oh, yeah, right? Exactly. Right? Yeah. And so when they come in, do they do an office tour as well, mm -hmm. like before yeah. the consultation? They so do, we actually do it after the consultation. Okay. okay. So consultation, uh, doctor comes in. Mm -hmm gets the 90 second rundown, mm -hmm. does the chiropractic exam, they finish up the exam, do the x-rays, yep. then do the um, tour after they that? They actually do the, well, the way our office is set up is our, our new patient um, consultation room is towards the front of the office, Got our x-rays are way in the back. Got it. So after the consultation exam, then they kind of take them back and they just show them the kids area, they show them mm -hmm. where the bathroom is, they show them the adjusting areas, they show them all that stuff Got going it. back to uh, know where massage rooms are, everything on the way back to the x-rays. Great. Yeah, I like at some point I've just got to like pull the bandaid off. Because I think what happens is, the doctor is like worried, well, like, is it, is the patient gonna have as good of an experience and are they gonna be as ready for like my recommendations on day two? But like you said, the the new patient, this is the first time they've ever done it. So they they could just, it, it's, either, it's either the first day you have done this or it's the 10th year, they have no idea. And right? they're trained that way, think about it. When most people go to a, an allopathic medical doctor, mm -hmm. The doctor doesn't do the, the, it's the nurse who comes in and asks you all the questions and yeah. measures your blood pressure and does all that stuff anyway. Yeah. So people are used to having the doctor's assistant do that stuff. Right. It's no different. Yeah. And they do a way better job than I would have done. Right. It, that's again, if you get the, if you get the right person, 
in that position, it's like that's the thing that they're strong at is that empathetic connection. So and it frees up so much time because now we can take new patients just during regular adjusting times because yeah. you only have to go in six seven minutes as the doctor's with them. Yeah. So when you so now you I'm I'm sorry. What did you say you're seeing right now in terms of uh, visits per week? In the mid four hundreds. In the mid four. And then you were in the like. 250, 300 range, like for as of decade. like <laughs> for like three or four years ago? Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's a big jump. And I can't imagine that you like doubled your new patients on that. Years ago. Yeah. But you didn't like really like double the new patients. It was more, were you converting more? Were you retaining more? Um, no, we got more new patients. Did I think you? we also definitely converted and retained more. I think all of them, actually retention is still a thing we're probably weakest at. That's yeah. one thing we're, we're continuing to work on. But um, we probably increased our new patients, you know, twenty percent or so. But we yeah. definitely got better at converting. That's correct for sure. Uh, what was the big change there? You think on getting better at conversion? Um, we went over to doing group um, day twos or group report of findings, okay. and it just works so well. Really? Yeah, it, it's just it, especially for my personality. Like mm -hmm. I don't like to spend one on one time with somebody, you know. Thanks, but I can say to, really to six it. people at once. <laughs> 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 but I can speak to six people at once, and it works great. Especially with you know three doctors in the office, yeah. it's so much easier. And all three of us do an individual one on one. It's like we have a group, and so with the group, you know, we can all three of us doctors can easily just grab our one or two or three patients, and we do the individual reports with them. Um, and it's just it's so streamlined, makes it so much easier. On the group report of finding, you're basically mm -hmm. doing. The, the general information where you're teaching mm -hmm. to everybody and then yep. you're going over their individual stuff. Along. That's private. Yeah, that's all yep. private. Yep. How long does it take for the private ones to... Like so the like whole thing is an hour long. Okay. The whole thing. We spent about 10 to 12 minutes initially in the room kind of explaining. We basically go over spinal generation, subluxation, understanding all that stuff. Then yeah. the individual, um, you know, four or five minutes, depending on how many questions they have. Yeah. And so, and then after that, we kind of adjust them and then we go back in and we go over all the financials, all that kind of stuff, and then they close them at the end. Nice. Um, but we can take, we can take up, each doctor can have up to three people in a report. We can get that done in an hour. Got so it. we can have up to nine, um, your report of findings in one hour. I mean, that's pretty uh, efficient. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now that, now that you're over a, a million, what's the, what's the bigger, the biggest challenge? What's the, the thing you're kind of thinking about the most? Yeah, you know what? Um, Keep, keep scaling from here. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest challenge was getting from that five to 600 to a million. And I think the big thing for me was realizing I can't do everything myself. Yeah. Um, I was a, like most entrepreneurs, a super control freak. I, I knew I was very good at certain things and I just didn't want to give those up. But the yeah. problem is in order to grow, you got to give those things up. Yeah. And so I just realized by delegating stuff that I could accomplish way more, mm -hmm. we could grow more, could have more doctors, more CAs, more, you know, everything. And I don't have to do it all. And through that process, I'm able to actually not only grow, but I can take vacations. I can be out of the office. Like mm -hmm. you know, I'm not in the office today, and we're still seeing a bunch of patients. Yeah. Um, and so it's just so much less dependent on me. Um, now, once you get that down, then you can scale. And that's when you can get above a million. I think and at that point, it's just how far do you want to go from there? Right. Yeah. Because I, you know, once you once you've got the team in place, you got the systems in place, you got your mindset in place, mm -hmm. then it's really just about like how many bodies can we get yeah. into the office and put through? Because if the machine works whether you've got 10 new patients or 50 new patients or 100 new patients mm -hmm. it's just you know the more you put in there the more stay the more, the more convert the more stay and the more that thing grows and then you need there's you know each doctor can only see so many people and then you got to bring in new people and i think that that's the that's really the opportunity in chiropractic is for people that are at this stage that are interested in growing it beyond what like one or two doctors can see mm -hmm. to where, I mean, I, you're like me. I mean, I'd love to have 10 doctors yeah. in there just, you know, right cracking and cracking them, you know? So. As long as you have a big enough, uh, you know, patient base here, a big enough area um, yeah. that has enough yeah. people in the community to, to, to push that, absolutely. And what I learned is I, I really don't love adjusting. I, I, that's not my thing. And, and I've learned, you know, through some personality testing and stuff, you know, at first that seemed like, an, you know, chiropractor can't say that mm -hmm. i love chiropractic but yeah. i love the business side of it you yeah. know that's where i want to be and i have two associates that love to be you know caregivers they love to adjust people so yeah. it's like a perfect mix they just want to show up adjust people all day and go home yeah. i want to show up and do the business and not really yeah. adjust anybody yeah. and go home and so it works out great that uh you know actually last year we hit a million i saw the least amount of patients personally that i adjusted in over a decade that's right because i'm they're just i'm getting them to grow and them, yeah. them to rise and i'm scaling back i always knew that we were brothers from a different mother you know because <laughs> I, I just i like basically i just figured it out before I was even successful, like I was just like, I, there's no way. Like I was the problem. Like you at least, oh, yeah. you at least were capable of like doing both of like growing a business and seeing the patients. I was not. So like year five, I'm just like, all right, 
second associates in, all right, I'm retired from, from seeing patients. And yeah. that's how the thing grew. Yeah. But you got to be honest with yourself and you got to know like what your strengths and weaknesses are. Yeah. And, like what you're actually going to do. Yeah. You know? well, I started noticing when I'm adjusting patients, I wasn't thinking about them. I was thinking about what am I going to do when I go after I'm adjusting them to go back and what marketing thing am I going to work on? Or right. what, what new business strategy am I yes. going to implement? Like I was, my mind is more there than it is with yeah. the patient. Yeah. That's why I realized, why am I doing this? Yeah. But uh, we did a, um, right after I had uh, stopped seeing patients, or I was like, I, I had hired my second associate, but I was like uh, finishing everybody's care plans and like handing them off to the second to the two associates. And we sent out like this um, survey monkey to like all patients mm -hmm. and just how was your experience, any feedback, blah, blah, blah. And all, I mean, it's 99% positive, you know, but there was the 1%, it, there was this common thread. It was, it was, you know, I like Dr. Nick, but it just doesn't seem like he's very focused on me when I'm there. And I'm like, I'm like, that is a good sign of, of I am making the right decision here. Cause they deserve that. They deserve, sure. they deserve caretakers that are going to like be a hundred percent focused on them. And that was always, always a struggle with me was trying to, um, like take the business hat off, go see patients, mm -hmm. then go back, put the business hat back on. I'm just like, man, I can't do that. It was just like stressing me out to no end. So and the good thing is there's way more caregiver chiropractors yes. out there than there are CEO minded. Exactly. And so those caregivers, they need people like us to set yep. up the structure, to hire and fire employees, yep. to, you know, set up the systems and deal with all the payroll, you know, they need us because they don't want to do that. They just want right. to show up and, and love on patients. Exactly. So it's perfect. Yeah. So the, uh, we're in the CEO program and how, how is that like really changed the way that that you, I know you've been coaching with Franson for a while, but yeah. like the CEO program, I feel like is just very structured in, in that way. So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really helped me. Uh, you know, I think just working with, with Dr. Franson for a couple of years, even before the CEO program really gave me a lot of just mindset around it's okay to just be the business owner. It's yeah. okay to not want to adjust people. It really is okay. Yeah. And then from there, just, you know, just going from, you know, the, in my visionary, I'm an integrator working with my integrator and just trying to scale and do all that stuff. Um, and then the whole CEO program has really helped me, you know, setting up my, my vision, my mission, my core values, all that stuff and really utilizing, cause we always have that mission statement, you know, yep. but usually we just found it somewhere and just threw it up on the wall, right, right. but actually really creating what is the vision you want to create and why, yeah. and then really inspiring your employees to, to follow into that and want to, you know, want to help you reach that mission. And hiring and firing based off of those and oh, core values, you know, having yeah. them, having them bought into that mm -hmm. on, on what it is that, yeah. that your vision is. Yeah. Um, uh, before I talk about the the political stuff, um, it, so in terms of content creation, so I think that your office does a really good job of of creating content. You're good on video. Yeah. What's that been like in terms of um, uh, improving like how much people see you in the community? Oh, yeah. um, you know, just talk to me about that a little bit, and yeah. just like what your mindset is with the content creation. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a great way to get out there. We, you know, between our Google AdWords out there and then also just on social media. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because I I don't look at it that much. In fact, I don't even look at the videos after my my, my, <laughs> my video person shoots them and ed edits them. Right. Um, but I see people all the time in the community. They'll be like, hey, you're that guy I saw on Facebook. Yeah. I'll be like, what? And they're like, yeah, you're the guy doing the doing the, the neck stretch videos and doing this and that. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, nice yeah. to meet you. <laughs> you're right. You know, so I'm like, wow, people see it apparently. Yeah. Um, I'll even patients all the time be like, man, you keep coming up my news feed. Yeah. Like, you know, you keep coming up. So I was like, yeah, we're getting, getting the message out, which is kind of cool. And I think that that is, um, you know, that's one of the things that I talk about. That's kind of like an, uh, cause there are, everybody's always worried about like using the content to bring in new patients, mm -hmm. but it's, it's such a powerful thing to like stay in front of your existing patients. Sure. And it gives them a way to like, sh like, Hey, this is my doctor. I've been telling you about instead of them just like referring you someone mm -hmm. they can actually show them like here's what it, you have this problem here's him mm -hmm. talking about it you know i think that's yeah. a, a valuable piece yeah, that's probably the biggest comment that we see is our patients will comment on a video and say hey john this is my chiropractor yeah. that i've seen hey da, da. Well, they, yeah. so they can see us talking they can see we're normal people exactly and, so they're much more comfortable when they can see a video yeah even if it's not like the condition that they have mm -hmm. it's still that they can see that it oh that looks like a nice place so he seems nice yeah, yeah. so yeah. yeah um so you're president of the mac yeah. Uh, you were vice president before, correct? Uh, no, I was a, a board member before, okay. but yeah. Um, so just tell me like, why is it so important to be involved with your state association? Well, cause we, I think as chiropractors, we take our ability to practice uh, for granted mm -hmm. and it really is not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we can lose what we have very quickly. There's a lot of, uh, we have a lot more uh, opponents out there mm -hmm. in the healthcare realm than we do have friends. Mm -hmm. And, uh, very powerful opponents that don't like us very much and don't want us around. And so we have to constantly be pushing forward mm -hmm. or else I think we can lose it. I remember, I'll tell you a quick story back in 
if you remember, this might be before your time, back in 2002, Life University lost their accreditation. This yeah, was in school. Right. Were you okay? Yeah. I just graduated from Palmer and this was like, you know, I, I was so new, I didn't really know what was going on, but um, you know, in Michigan, where I'm from, you know, the, Sid Williams and like five Michigan doctors founded Life University. Mm -hmm. So it was a big thing. They were scrambling because, you know, you lose your accreditation, you lose like half your students, you have no more money to pay bills, you don't have anything anymore. Yeah. Um, and so they thought well, they were going to close the school completely. And I was like, okay, well, you know, there's other chiropractic schools, you know, a newbie out of school. And they're like, no, Life University is like the, you know, as far as philosophically based chiropractic, like we cannot lose this because chiropractic could literally, as we know it, BJ Palmer philosophy could go away. Yeah. And I was like, really, really? And I remember seeing uh, Chuck Ribley. I don't know if you know who he is, but yeah. he's uh, used to be the chancellor, one of my mentors from Michigan. Um, and uh, he was going around doing these tours trying to generate students. Like, we need to get students out of Life University as much as possible. And so we were doing these tours just to high schools and all these places just to, you know, get people that wanted to go to school. And literally sending them right down to life, like, immediately. Right. Um, and uh, he said something one time at a, at, a, at, a, at a talk. He said that, you know, my fear is that my grandkids or my great-grandkids, you know, someday will not be able to get a chiropractic adjustment. Mm -hmm. And I was like, come on. But then I thought about it, like, it's very possible. Yeah. You know, if we go the allopathic realm, I mean, you look at like DOs. DOs used to be very vitalistic. Mm -hmm. look, like you can't even tell the difference between them and an MD anymore. Right. And so that's what I'm like, we have to keep fighting, we have to keep pushing and to never you know, give up our right to practice how we want to practice. Yeah. What would you recommend, you know, as somebody who, you know, is looking for Michigan doctors to, to be a part of, of, you know, the efforts of the, of the MAC? Just in any state, like what can an individual doctor that's like the most impactful uh, that you think? What, what can they do? Yeah, what can they do? Sorry. Yeah, well, first of all, get involved in your state association. That's yeah. the best way to do it because it's there's there's strength in numbers. Yeah. You're not going to be able to, I mean, you can always go in and talk to your legislators. Mm -hmm. It's really about the political. You have to get in with your legislators. Um, you know, we, we just like local state senator, yeah, local rep, yeah, your local yeah. reps, anybody that, especially when they're not getting, like U.S. reps, but just like your state, oh, those two, but uh, yeah, just but your I, state, no, but, he, but those yeah. the state reps are much more accessible. Oh yeah, the when they have rep. a local town hall meeting or they have coffee, you know, with yeah. your rep, just go meet with them, just get to know them. Yeah. So when things do come up that are very important for chiropractic or healthcare, that they they're willing to listen to you because they kind of know you. Yeah. And that's something we've done a really good job. You know, back we, the MAC was formed. Well, 13 years ago. Prior to that, we had two complete separate associations who had very different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And for years, we couldn't get anything done in Lansing because, you know, these representatives are hearing from two different voices from two different people. And they're yeah. like, when you guys get together and figure it out, then maybe we'll listen to you. Yeah. And so once we actually merged, it's been smooth sailing. We've become huge now. And now they listen to us. We have legislators that call us up and say, hey, we have this healthcare bill coming up. We want the chiropractor's opinion on this. Yeah. And so it's just way more power in the, in the state capital than like we ever has. Some random person that is, you know, some state rep or state mm -hmm. senator doesn't know the difference between philosophically different chiropractic groups. Like chiropractic yeah. is chiropractic. He They're like the care. general public. Like <laughs> chiropractic is chiropractic. Yeah. They need to speak with one voice. And like the, we have so much more in common than we do yes. differences that it's just, it's so nonsense to, to be like arguing and bickering and uh, like inside, like, you know, circling the wagons and then firing in. Like that's, 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 that's not what we've been problem. doing for hundred years, but that's the big push now is nationally we have to unify. We, we, we simply have to. Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to get crushed if we don't. Yeah. So I saw you guys just were, uh, you were in DC, mm -hmm. uh, was it January? February? Yeah. In January. Yeah. yeah. And what that every year that happens, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we were down there actually with the Cairo Congress, um, which is, is, uh, basically all 50 state associations. Well, I think like, 38 or something that are a part of this. And yeah. we're kind of pushing Cairo Congress to be the, the, the leader nationally because some of the other associations just can't seem to agree on things. And yeah. so Cairo Congress seems to be the one that's uh, encapsulating that. And so we're really pushing them to hopefully be the leading national uh, association. But we were down there with them and uh, they basically, we do a legislation day where a bunch of different people from different states come in and they kind of you know teach the people that have never done it before how to talk to senators, how to talk to you know house reps. And then uh, we go on the Hill and we spend an entire day meeting with our local and U.S. state reps and senators and just yeah. talk about what we do and the bills that were, you know, are important to us and yeah. why they're important. You know, the big thing lately has been on uh, opioids. Mm -hmm. and that's been a big, uh, big thing that we can use as a uh, helpful tool for us. Yeah, right. Um, and so that's that's what it's all about. Nice. Uh, any other like pieces of wisdom, any tips that uh, we didn't cover that you think the, uh, the listeners out there could benefit from? Um, the biggest thing, going back to just learning how to give up 
control. Mm -hmm. That was probably the biggest thing for me to become successful was, I don't care how good you are, you can only do so much yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you only see so many people, you can only you know, manage so many employees. And so if you really wanna grow and you wanna be a CEO, you have to really trust um, to, to delegate. And uh, you know, great thing, I think it was Dr. John Martini said that if somebody can do something 80% as well as you can, yep. delegate it. Yep. Yeah, because yeah, they won't be perfect like you think you are, but they're gonna do it and you won't have to. Right. And then just, you can keep doing that and keep doing that and you get more people and keep delegating. Next yeah. thing you know, you have all these jobs you no longer have to do. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they're gonna be better than you at those jobs. Yeah, And so because it's like 80 is the minute. It doesn't yeah. mean they have to be 80. No. A lot of people that work for me are like 150. Yeah. You know? And there's no way I would ever do that or infinite really because there's it would never get done if I had to do it yeah. you know so the things that I have trouble delegating are the things that I like doing mm -hmm. it's really easy to delegate the stuff you don't like yeah. but the stuff that you do like that's where that 80% rule and that's the rule that I actually my my minimum is probably about 40% I'm just like just take it like yeah. just we'll see if you're really good at it and hopefully we can train you up if you're not but. yeah and don't hire people like you because yeah. you can already do that hire exactly. people opposite of you so they their strengths are different than yours yeah so I think we've always been told growing up that we have to work on our weaknesses. Yeah. But no, forget that. You know what? Delegate your weaknesses. Yes. Work on your strengths. Yes. That's where you're going to be most effective. Triple down on, on And the that strengths. was a huge thing for me. It's like, okay, well, I'm not good at that. So you know what? I'm not going to try to get better. I'm just not going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to find somebody else that's good at it. Because you never do get any no. better at it. It's just and even like, if you do, you don't like it's it. It's miserable. <laughs> right. Right. You can do it, but yeah. I, you don't enjoy it. And the only way that you can like eat like the the thing that is uh that is nice with abundance mm -hmm. is that now you have resources to deploy in any way that you want and a lot of times in an office that comes down to people mm -hmm. and but you have to pay them yes. and you can't have 80 percent of your uh, of your overhead being payroll mm -hmm. so you have to learn how to grow and you have to be able to, to make sure that that team member is going to help you go to another level um, because the more abundant you are the more that you can um, you know, give and serve and all that. And, yeah. and that's why we're, when we said, or I said earlier that I'd love to have 10 chiropractors. It's just a matter of like, can you be abundant enough to, uh, to supply for all of them? Yeah. So, that's well, Eric, I really appreciate it, man. Uh, I always love getting to spend time with you. We're yeah, here man. at UAC this weekend and, uh, we got to get out to the, the, the Vegas club scene out of the, out of the pool. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, so I appreciate you being on, man. Right. And, uh, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Always. And we'll see you on the next one.